We've done the uh, first five locations, now we're going to go to the very last five locations. The first five and the last five are the most important uh, to be able to identify that uh, we've actually figured out this copper scroll. So writer number four has just begun writing and if you'll notice he only has five locations that he's hidden. Uh, writer number one I believe had 18 and the other gentleman that wrote on this copper scroll had at least that many, 14 to 18, 24, something like that. But what's significant is writer number four only has five locations. So we're going to start reading these and we're going to identify them. I'm going to show you what I believe happened. Writer number four, it appears that he was actually utilizing his locations to point us in the direction of the buried cave, uh, the one that we had talked about earlier, the heap of color. Uh, what it says is this, by the fountain of intercourse and the place of the trading encampment concealed are 900 talents of silver and gold talents. Now this either means that there's 900 talents of gold, 900 talents of silver, a total of 1800 talents, or a combination thereof totaling 900 talents. I don't know. But it says, by the fountain of intercourse at the place of the trading encampment. When you look at the map, you'll see that at the southern end of Qumran, there was an area for camping for uh, those that came to trade to buy, um, let's say they were selling pots or pottery here. They could come here and trade. I believe that the trading encampment was intended for salt because they had a large pit there where they would be able to produce salt, <clears throat> which is a very valuable commodity at the time. So now they had to have a place for these people that were coming in to camp and to be able to um, have some place to stay while they, while they made the purchase and went from there to either back to their homes or to Jerusalem to make, uh, to do, sell some of this stuff. But what is a fountain of intercourse? Uh, that uh, would be at its trading encampment if a, a couple were there, a couple were there, a married couple, and they were romantic in the, during the evening. They had to have a place to cleanse themselves before entering back into the encampment. Uh, so if, as you notice on this, uh, on the map, you'll see that in the very bottom right, there is a uh, pool. It's a, there's an old picture, it's a black and white picture, but if you'll notice this pool, is, uh, it's got a paved area right beside it, and it's a tiny thing. It's, uh, it's about two and a half feet in diameter. A, a person could step into this pool, cleanse themselves without ever exposing themselves to those around, and cleanse themselves, and all the body fluids and any of the liquids would then follow a little trough that heads down uh, to, the, uh, to the south and actually exits right at the edge of the community on the far east side. There's a wall there very close where this... Uh, trough would lead the water out completely away from the encampment. L56. Near from there is a great quantity of 62 talents. Under the sooty stones, under the sexual basin is talents. So again, uh, writer number four is referring back to the, uh, the sexual basin that we talked about earlier. But he gives, a, uh, he gives a, a, an amount. 62 talents, but he calls it a great quantity. He's not talking about gold or silver here. There's no indication of gold or silver, so the only other thing that it could possibly be or probably be would be gems and a great quantity of them. They held these gems apparently in high esteem because each time they talk about the gems, they refer to it as uh, in other locations as a hundredfold fortune or uh, a great quantity. Uh, but 62 talents is not a large quantity compared to the other sites of gold and silver. So this location most probably is going to be gems. If you'll notice, the location is just above and a little to the right of the uh, sexual basin. Now I draw, drew a line from uh, L55 and L56, and of course it's a, a straight line. But then when I went to L57, 
something interesting began to happen. L57, placed under the steps of the highest building of mass feeding of the young, where the wives and sisters give sustenance, there are 90 silver talents. It says, placed under the steps of the highest building. The highest building at Qumran is the, what is referred to to this day as a scriptorium. But the other building that is large is, a, there's a, is the building where the, which would have been considered the treasury, the, um, the pyramid with the missing top, if you will. But the only steps at Qumran that extend upward are the steps at, this, uh, at these two large buildings. It's almost in between the two buildings. But the kitchen area is just a short distance away. Uh, in order to feed that many children, and if they fed them in the upper building, they would have wanted them close to the kitchen area. But it goes on to say this, that the mass feeding of the young where the wives and sisters give sustenance, there are 90 silver talents. The room where the uh, stairs actually are located, the room is paved with stones. So it's unlikely that they would have buried the, uh, the treasure there. In fact, right next to, on the other side of the wall, just uh, less than a foot away, uh, they could have buried it within a meter of the steps is where I believe they buried it. But whenever I identified this spot, I realized what this person was doing. Location L55, L56, and L57 are forming a perfectly straight line and it's, it's going uphill and it's going in the direction of the heap of color. L58. At the edge of the fountain are gold vessels and silver vessels from the House of Honor. Wine, every silver talent is 600. A talent of silver, 75 pounds, uh, melted into a large ingot would not take up that much room. But if that same ingot were pressed into or molded into wine vessels or bowls, it's going to take up a lot of room. So the, the, this is the next to the last location. And at this point, Qumran had been filled up with uh, the burial sites. It had taken up all of Qumran. It's just about covered the entire complex. So if I'm correct, the only large area left would have been just outside of the wall, which uh, we had referred to earlier as a peristyle. And the uppermost opening where it enters is the same one that they're calling here the fountain, at the edge of the fountain. So now at the edge of the fountain, the uppermost opening, they bury 600 talents of silver vessels. That would take a lot of room. So now they bury it at this location but what I did was I took a pen and I took a satellite photograph once I realized what this man was doing and I poked holes in each one of these locations into that map, satellite map. And then I drew a hairline through it with a very sharp pencil and it crossed over the exact spot where I'd stood in February of 2007 and identified it with my wife standing there saying, this is the only place that matches L59 which is the next location we're going to, which is very important because it gives the description and location of the Berry Cave near the heap of color. L59. In the great hollow entry for all that is involved in the wealth of the house, all the weight that is counted gives a, a specific number and I'm not sure exactly what that would be. Placed in the north of the heap of color in the dry north entrance that is buried by the edge is another copy of the record that explains the anointing, the wealth, and the scattered words, united they are one. So now I've got a description of a cave that has been buried. It says that is placed in the north of the heap of color in the dry north entrance that is buried by the edge. In February of 2007, I looked for this place um, in the north of the heap of color, and I went to the extreme north end of this heap. And right next to that is a, a large V-shape in the rock that appear very much, appears to be very much a cave or the opening of a cave that has been buried. Then when we go to, uh, we go to 2nd Maccabees, 
I'm going to read from that and, and you'll be able to see the comparison between these two. It reads like this. And when Jeremiah came thither, he found a hollow cave, and he took the tent and the ark and the altar of incense into it, and he blocked the entrance. Now listen to what the Copper Scroll says. In the great hollow entry, for all that is involved in the wealth of the house, the weight that is counted, and he gives a measurement, placed in the north of the heap of color, in the dry north entrance that is buried by the edge. So now he, in 2 Maccabees, it says a hollow cave. In the Copper Scroll, it says a great hollow entry. In 2 Maccabees, it says that he blocked the entrance. Copper Scroll says, at the dry north entrance that is buried. So they both refer to these items and, or these locations and gives the same type of description using actually the same words. But as I looked at this, you'll see that when he talks about buried by the edge, it took me uh, several minutes to figure out what he was talking about, whoever wrote this. Buried by the edge, the pic some of the pictures we took, we were standing on a mound that is directly north of the heap of color. If we had taken one step backwards, we would have fallen off a cliff. So we were within 20, 30 feet of the opening of the cave and we were standing right over the point of a cliff edge. So when it says buried by the edge, it was referring to a, the edge of a cliff. So now the fingerprint that we've been looking at through this entire portion uh, is developed in such a way that if I were uh, prosecuting an individual that had this many points matching, it would be it would be a open and closed case because it'd be so simple to point out that this person was a man that committed the crime. In this situation, the greatest kind of crime we can commit is by not going back and looking at this and testing this site to ensure that these sites are not there or if they are there, then we have an obligation or I would think that the Israeli government would have an obligation to take these items and secure them. With Schukendorfman, I mean, these uh, the Antiquities Authority has taken my research very seriously. I mean, they've gone to the point, they've allowed us to dig at three sites, one of them being the point of the buried cave. Another location is uh, L7, and another location was just outside of the large cistern that is at Qumran. But if they give these items away, or give these locations away, uh, it's it's going to be a great loss. And with the Israeli Antiquities Authority taking my work that serious, uh, serious enough that they would take stones off the top of a uh, drainage canal, uh, not really damaging it, but uh, taking it apart just to dig a few inches. It, it didn't make any sense to me. But it, even at the cave, we dug, we were, had planned on going at least two meters. I think we dug probably four feet, um, which uh, two meters is over six feet, so we were short another two feet. We'd agreed to go at least that deep, uh, two meters, but we didn't. We went about a meter and a half and stopped. Um, the archaeologist that was in charge, I got have a great respect for the man, so I didn't argue with him. Um, he was the man in charge. I was simply providing the uh, documentation and the research. We just didn't go deep enough. Not at that location or the next location where we dug, which was L7. When we opened up that tunnel or the drainage canal, um, there was 2,000 years of sediment built up inside of there. And we dug down to the, we didn't even dig all the way to the bottom of the sediment before we stopped. We dug down approximately um, one third of a meter, uh, and not even that much actually. And we stopped, and on the, on the uh, scroll, it refers to cubits, plural. Uh, in the Hebrew, it was plural, meaning there were more than one cubit. And if a cubit's 19.2 inches, we only went about 12 inches, which just was ridiculous as far as reaching a level where we can make a determination. So now, three sites we've dug at, each one of them we went just very shallow, just barely scratched the surface. 
didn't go near the depth required as, as directed on the copper scroll. Uh, so there's no way to really know if those items are still there or not because we didn't go to a, a respectable depth to either prove or disprove the research. Another reason uh, that uh, we're concerned and uh, produced this video was that there are things happening in Israel right now that, for example, uh, just a few days ago, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, talked about a two-state solution. Well, all of these locations, Qumran itself, is located in the West Bank. If that land is given away, and if, in fact, these items still remain at Qumran, uh, then they're going to be given away an incredible treasure. And uh, honestly, who cares about the gold and silver? They, it's the items, or they're precious. There's no way to ever replace these items if, in fact, they're there. Uh, for goodness sakes, um, yeah, the Tabernacle of Moses, the, the vessels that were utilized either in the temple or in the tab tabernacle makes no difference. Their, their historic value is just uh, it's priceless. So if a two-state solution is they, they come to a, a decision to give away this land, it's going to be given away as well. And now, again, it's just incredibly important. Before any of the land is given away, before any agreements are made uh, by this government or some government in the future uh, in charge of Israel, that we check these sites uh, with some minimally, minimal uh, invasive techniques we could drill, we could uh, use a small head on a uh, tiny backhoe and go down to the depths required because there are places at Qumran where there are large amounts, entire trenches full of silver ingots. We would be able to cut across the trench, do a small cut, and test to see if these items still remain there to this day. Mm -hmm.